start us off, uh, the actual title of this presentation uh, was actually a mystery to us all until uh, Matt McLean explained it to us about a week ago. But uh, I would be giving away the big secret uh, until we get to his part of the presentation. So I'll let it remain a mystery right now, just like Lost. <laughs> anyway, uh, that being said, um, we have been working on a title called Alpha Protocol for the past four years, and it's been a very, very long, arduous journey. Um, it was filled with a lot of choice. <laughs> And so uh, we decided to uh, make that our example of what we were going to dissect during this presentation today in terms of RPGs. Um, that being said, though, uh, we wanted to sort of give you a, uh, a brief trailer that sort of en uh, encompasses the story of the game. Uh, the trailer is entitled A Man Alone, which is a very, very, very powerful name for a trailer. Um, <laughs> and that being said, uh, the lovely Joe Bullock will, uh, will now play it with any luck from our audiovisual. Yeah, sorry about that lo fi stuff. Found executed. Possession of nope. Start over. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> Quality. <laughs> all, right. all about professionalism here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I fixed it. it I always fix it. It was not plugged in. Right. It was not plugged in. You gotta put it in there. All right, all right. Try and take You're two. scaring sorry him. You're scaring that. him. Stop, please. <laughs> Yeah. Rated M for mature. The big five. A leading arms traffic terrorist organization found executed. Possession of over 100 ammunition, missiles, and. That airliner was his first target. How did she he get his hands on that missile? He's got more. Then we want you to kill him. You think you have all the bases covered, your backup plan all in place. You don't. You're here for the missiles, so let's not play games. We work together, we both get what we want. And I thought I might have to work harder. How back is smuggling weapons into Moscow? Who's their contact here? I do not know. All these plans of yours aren't going to cause a cold war. They're going to cause a real one. You're becoming a real estate authority. There are conflicts. And then there are wars. Mike, they used you. I certainly hope you're not blaming me for something you could have prevented. You're on your own. Alpha Protocol is the only thing protecting you right now. People you care about start to die I always wondered did you ever regret getting into this Leyland I'm going to kill you well that didn't turn out like you thought Tim. Right. Stop it, see, make sure it doesn't play another one. Let's stop it. Stop it. It's cool, it's cool. I got it under control here. All right, uh, so that's uh, our trailer for uh, Alpha Protocol um, with a, the a subtitle that we would have preferred, but you know, we don't get everything we want. Uh, um, so after looking at that trailer, uh, you know, what is our game about? Uh, well, uh, is it about uh, backward explosions? Uh, that, would, that would be no. Um, is it about uh, rising violins? Uh, that would also be no. Oh, by the way, funny story, I already have to backtrack because I'm already distracted. Uh, when Sean Stewart saw this slide, he was like, dude, what is Moob? <laughs> Tell me what the is, secret of Moob. Moob. Why, it's a backwards explosion, dude. I could watch that like 500 times. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the power of PowerPoint. By the way, I hate PowerPoint. PowerPoint sucks. All right, anyway, Rising Violins. Okay, uh, so that game we made, you know what, Sean, if you don't shut up, I'm going to throw you off this podium. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stupid mic being on. Uh, so it's about neither backwards explosions nor rising violins. Uh, it's our espionage RPG that we built uh, dr using uh, dramatic drum roll. Uh, 
the Epic Games Unreal 3 Engine. And uh, uh, actually, for a show of hands, how many of you are looking to get into the game industry as level designers or environment artists? Anybody? Wow, all right, well maybe you 20 people might want to check out the Unreal 3 editor, and that, because uh, that's about every game studio I know of is using Unreal 3 for their products. Anyway, uh, and my big fat check is coming for that, for that announcement. <laughs> So uh, I'm Chris Avalon, uh, I'm lead designer on Alpha Protocol, uh, and uh, to my left... I'm Matt McLean, the lead systems designer on Alpha Protocol, and I'm the Obsidian Hall monitor as well. <laughs> and uh, if I may go on a quick detour here for a second, the, uh, the fine gentleman Mac, Mac, Matt McLean that you see before you, uh, once upon a time, had no beard. <laughs> But then he made a choice that he was not going to shave any part of his body until Alpha Protocol was released. That's so That's totally true. that now accounts for the beautiful, glorious beer that you see before you. Yeah, beer. Let's give it up. Uh, we, we do have a mystery guest. Uh, one of our programmers was supposed to join us for the panel, but he decided to sit on the front row instead. Uh, he's, a, he's a programmer, and I use that in quotes because uh, programmers at our company use weird things like they talk about numbers and data and code and how to implement stuff, and there's never enough fucking time, and like just all this crazy stuff. We just ignore. We're like, whatever. <laughs> so anyway, uh, if you see Dan around the show, uh, chances are he'll be molesting flowers. And... Uh, our other, other title for him is uh, Sir Who Will Not Be Appearing in This Film, <laughs> or this panel, there or thereabouts. But, but give him a hug. He's very touchy-feely. Aww. <laughs> oh, God, that's me. I, uh, uh, hi, I'm Joseph Bullock, and I am the lead cinematic designer. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a lot, it's a lot more amazing than it sounds. This picture will prove it. <laughs> that, that's how Joe usually looks at work. Yeah, that's our, that's our dress code. Yeah. And uh, I'm Sean Stewart. I'm Joe's partner in crime. We uh, spent a lot of time together. You are making uh, that sound not I'm, uh, so good. Cinematics lead. He's a lot happier about it than he sounds. Yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, before we get started here, uh, we uh, all got together earlier this week to practice this presentation, and then uh, Matt McLean uh, had the idea of, you know what? We say choice so much in this presentation, we should turn it into a drinking game. And you know what? <laughs> It's a- apple juice. We're drink- drinking. Uh, apple so we decided, you know what? We don't want to drink any beer on stage. So this is, in fact, apple juice yeah. that smells remarkably like delicious beer. <laughs> <laughs> so that being said, anyone who's not speaking, if the word choice gets uttered by the speaker, <laughs> yes. Oh, by the way, it's all fair because I go last, too. So. And that's how it's going to work. So, okay, so Obsidian Obsidian Entertainment. Uh, So what the fuck do we do? Uh, Well, our studio focus is uh, we do role-playing games. Uh, We've worked with a lot of franchises. We've worked with uh, Star Wars, uh, Knights of the Old Republic 2, The Sith Lords, perhaps the longest title of any game I've ever worked on. I mean, there's a lot of Sith Lords in that game, geez. Uh, also, uh, a whole hell of a lot of Dungeons & Dragons games. We worked on uh, Neverwinter Nights 2, uh, Mask of the Betrayer, and also Storm of Zaheer. And without any surprise, we have Alpha Protocol coming out on June 1st. And uh, we're also working on a small game called Fallout New Vegas. I told you guys they'd clap. They I would. They'd clap. Uh, which is coming out at the end of 2010. So, a brief note about questions. Uh, Originally, we thought that perhaps maybe 10 or 12 people uh, might attend this panel, so we were like, oh man, just let them interrupt whenever they want, if they want to ask a question or derail us, like, we don't care. Um, Now that we know there's 300 of you, uh, we're going to save the questions for the end, and then uh, there'll be a mic there in the middle of the room, just line up, ask whatever you want, and if you don't get a chance to ask your questions, uh, we'll be around uh, after the panel is over to answer anything you want. And uh, also, we'll have uh, contact information up on the PowerPoint slide, too. So if questions come to you after the panel, uh, feel free to email us. Uh, I'll be honest, no one would ever answer any of my questions when I was trying to get in the game industry. So if you have any questions, uh, our, the group here will be more than happy to answer anything that's on your mind. So there you go. So, OK. Uh, a little bit about choice and, uh, and alpha protocol. <laughs> oh, yeah, drink up, guys. <laughs> choice, choice, choice. Oh. 
It's such an important part of this game, I cannot stress it enough. Uh, this is one screenshot from one sequence in the game, and not only does Alpha Protocol have a lot of decisions about it, um, it also has a lot of visual reactivity based on things you've done in the game. For example, all the camera screens you see in this one sequence all of them will be changing depending on actions you've taken on missions before you reach this sequence. The amount of interactivity, uh, we have that going from the, the visual reactivity uh, to the relationships of companions in the game, uh, to how we format the scripts and the different dialogue choices you have with various characters, uh, how we track all that shit, and geez, that, oh my god, it's so much stuff. Uh, uh, how we track down the, uh, the cutscenes and matinee sequences, which can be relatively simple to increasingly complicated, to sort of this like hen, <laughs> this, this hente tentacle like mess <laughs> that will make you, make you want to burn your eyes out. It's so horrible. That seems really reactive. It's, it's really... You know what? It's all about reactivity. It is. And you know what, Sean? It's also about choice. <laughs> okay, uh, so why do we do all this shit? Um, well, it's pretty simple. Uh, we work on RPGs. And uh, part of the, the strength of an RPG is the amount of agency that we're giving to a player. Um, Whenever we provide the player with a choice in a role-playing game, we actually have responsibilities as developers to make, to make, to sort of like give payback and give a reward in that choice. The player should feel consequence as a result of all their actions, no matter how obscure the choice. <laughs> and the results of those actions, <laughs> decisions, <laughs> can, be, uh, can uh, come down to the amount of perks you might accumulate over the course of the game. Uh, the amount of email reactivity or various weapon vendors you may be, may be able to deal with over the course of the game or not, depending on decisions you've made. Uh, how various scenes play out in the game. Uh, what sort of dialogue options you get with various characters, uh, including uh, my favorite choice, Head Slam. <laughs> Um, also, uh, if you play the game, depending on the choices you make, uh, you can also ally yourself with a number of, uh, of NPCs in the game as well. Uh, some of them have revolvers and dyed hair, which, you know, if that's your thing, that's cool. We allow you to, we allow you to ally with them. And, you know, if you want to wear funny hats or sport a beard like Matt McLean, we allow for that too. And uh, no joke, we actually have sequences in the game that actually respond to the type of armor set you're wearing when you go on those missions. For example, if you're off to meet a dignitary of a foreign country and you show up in full combat armor, or like the Gears of War guy right here, <laughs> that politician is going to have questions for you when you show up at his office. They may be frightened questions that cause them to have a terrified pee in front of you, but you know what? That's, that's, that's his issue. So um, all this choice comes with a cost. Um, it can be tears. Uh, it can be blood. Uh, it can be copious amounts of semen, um, which is good because we have a sperm bank right down the street, and when it comes to raising money that way, we have absolutely no shame. So uh, why... Why do we give a shit about choice? <laughs> well, um, we, because again, we're doing a role-playing game, and even though we're providing a whole series of choices to players in Alpha Protocol, I seriously did not think it was going to be this many choices, guys. I, I, I feel a little bit bad. We should break out some more apple juice. I'm beginning to think. Um, so even though we're, we're providing all these choices for players in the game, um, <laughs> God, I, I, you know, I want to feel bad, but I'm Chris, just smiling. You're, you're digging yourself a grave, man. I, I am. The grave's being dead. I've, I've got like three it's more parts dead. of this presentation to go through. I'm a dead man. Um, but even so, uh, what we're here to talk about today is uh, not only the resource cost involved with providing these choices to the player, damn it, <laughs> but also the limits we placed on, uh, on those decisions as well. Um, and those limits uh, were technical, uh, they were due to animation, uh, scripting, uh, and most importantly, uh, which my, uh, my dear colleague Matt McLean here will now present, uh, it also came down to various systems in the game as well. And Matt has also been kind enough to be able to give us a brief overview of choice and role-playing games throughout history, which is no mean, team, mean feat. We love you, Matt. We love I, you. I love you, I too, Sean. So when we were meeting to go over this uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, Sean asked me, uh, what does but thou must mean? Glad seriously? you asked, Sean. <laughs> so, oh, why'd you put this in there? <laughs> so back in the old days, uh, 
back when you had to read books instead of just use Wikipedia, back before the birth of our Lord and Savior, XCOM, back when nerds had to masturbate with printed porn, there was this great game for the Nintendo, a little RPG called Dragon Warrior. And in this uh, game, there's an awesome scene where you beat this dragon, you save this princess, you bring her back to the castle. And she's like, uh, dost thou love me? And this prompt comes up saying yes or no. And I remember as a kid thinking, holy shit, I can tell this chick, like, sorry, lady, I'm too busy slaying dragons to figure out your crazy female anatomy. I don't love you. <laughs> Problem is, if you say no, she says, but thou must. And it just keeps looping over and over again until you destroy your NES or say yes, you love her. Um, <laughs> So that's kind of the beginning of choice. Fortunately, we've been uh, stumbling forward since then. Um, over the years, we've had games that, uh, like the Sierra Adventures, that present a ton of choices. Yeah, drink up, bitches. <laughs> um, and there's, you, can, you can do a lot of different things in the game, but the, the wonderful designer logic usually makes it such that there's only one actual, like, uh, correct way to do the game, and all these, like, you know, fake choices... Um, usually lead to, at best, comical cock-blocking and, at worst, fail states. Um, then we moved on to games that have uh, occasional decisions with short-lived consequences. Uh, like in Deus Ex, you can uh, solve missions in various ways, but when you get to the end of the game, how you solved any given mission doesn't really change the end of the game. And uh, Quest for Glory took those King's Quest puzzles and added multiple ways to solve them, but again, the end really wasn't a, a, an aggregate of how you solve those puzzles. And we certainly had open world games. If you haven't played a game like Daggerfall or Grand Theft Auto, you're probably a communist, a Nazi, maybe both. <laughs> and in these games, you have a huge amount of freedom to travel the world, and you can wreak havoc and watch the people respond to your debauchery. Uh, the problem is with these games, the, uh, the, the main plot was pretty linear, and the choice in the open world was pre pretty shallow. Yeah, I said choice. Um, <laughs> And the decision whether or not to beat up a hooker and kill her or not to beat up a hooker and kill her, it, that gets old pretty quickly, and you don't need a video game to, to encounter that decision. Um, <laughs> more recently, we've had a handful of games that attempt a huge amount of branching uh, with copious amounts of reactivity. Uh, do yourself a favor and get a copy of Way of the Samurai for uh, the PlayStation 2. It's, it's fantastic. Um, these games tend to be a little shorter than most, but, um, but they're, they're great stuff, and they're, they're a good sign of things to come. Uh, so... Uh, choice kicks ass, but as Chris mentioned, it's freaking expensive. Blood, semen, you know all that. Um, there's a reason that games are complicated. I mean, you have limited schedules, limited budgets, and uh, just adding a second path cranks up the, the complexity to 11. Um, to give you an analogy about how complex games are, um, I want to talk about t-shirts. Um, I set this up poorly. Yeah. Okay, I'm awesome. Yeah. All right. Um, let's say... Yeah. <laughs> This is hard. Let's say I gave you, uh, let's say we had these t-shirts that had ones or zeros on them. Um, in 1982, there was this uh, uh, AD&D game for the Intellivision uh, that was 60,000 bits. If we wanted to do a live action reenactment with t-shirts, which by the way are totally for sale, just see me after the lecture, I'll set you up. Um, we would need to give a t-shirt to everyone at PAX and we could do sort of like a, uh, uh, a LARP of the code of uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, the Intellivision. To do, I'm, I'm the uh, dragon slayed flag. I'm the dragon slayed flag. Dude, shut up. <laughs> we know. <laughs> uh, as much as I gave Dragon Warrior a hard time, it's far more complicated. Uh, you'd have to give a T-shirt to the entire population of Boston to uh, to, to LARP the code of Dragon Warrior, and to uh, reenact the code of Morrowind in 2002, you'd need to give a shirt to the entire human race. And I'm pretty sure you would need the subcontinent of India to do those awesome armor and weapon textures. <laughs> So games get bigger, but they're increasingly. But players are more easily distracted, and they rarely complete games. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they read web comics or go to conventions or something. Uh, Valve tracked the uh, highest level reached by everyone who played Half Life Two Episode One on on Steam, and less than half the people made it to the last level. And that's really sad because this is like the Electrum standard of awesome games. This is Half Life Two, and. No wonder, like, publishers and developers are, are, are reticent to put choice in a game because how do you know the player's even going to make it through one playthrough of your game, let alone two? Choice. Yeah. Oh, we'll Drink. Drink your apple juice. That's so sweet. <laughs> Honestly, <they're mess. laughs> uh, but makers of RPGs are kind of crazy, and we love choice. The holy grail of a game would be one that you could, a million players could play it 10 million different ways um, because choice is the best storytelling. Is there between playing, uh, between experiencing like a linear story of like the retelling of Fern Gully or Dune or something like that, and playing an interactive story about you know what can change the nature of a man? Like you take a game like Deus Ex, two people can play it and uh, see different endings, and they'd only see one ending to Avatar, and 
and the globe at the end of Deus Ex kind of looks like a butt. Um, Did you just figure that out right now? <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah, look at, check that shit out. Yeah. Um, nice. nice quote by Voltaire, though. Uh, choice can be pretty damn empowering. Uh, sure, in real life, you're a loser. You have a terrible sense of drama. You have no sense of humor. Uh, you have no individual brilliance. Um, but in a game with choice... <laughs> In a game with choice, you can customize your alter ego to be the uh, most awesome the opinions, the opinions expressed here are not necessarily <laughs> the opinions that will get us heard by the large majority of convention goers here. In a game with choice, you can choose to be someone with a freaking stylish set of armor who like, just does whatever the hell you want in this, in this alternate reality. Uh, and choice can be a source of catharsis and escapism. Um, a game with a well-developed uh, system of choice allows you to experiment with... Uh, with, a, with one decision, and then see how the consequences play out. And you could then replay the game or reload the game and see how, how things could have been, unlike real life. In real life, if you burn down someone's house, the New Hampshire State Troopers will pursue you for the rest of your life until you move to California and grow a beard. Who's that? That is me, actually. And that, 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 that is me, without, without a beard. Yeah, I look much better with a, a flaming house behind me. Uh, it's, bottom, all, it's all in the lighting. It's all in the lighting. <laughs> It's a soft mood lighting. Yeah, on my you high know. contrast it really, it really works. Out. My Alfred Molina look comes brings out. out your eyes. Yes. You look good. You look thanks, good. thanks. Yeah. Uh, the bottom line is, choice is fun. And uh, a book, in a book, you're just like experiencing the author's point of view. But in like a role playing game with a whole lot of decisions, you're actually sort of uh, blending with the narrator. Uh, choice lets you sort of merge with the storyteller and and. Yeah. Uh, well, don't look at me. I'm there. And incidentally, RPGs are great birth control. Um, nice. <laughs> so, a- as a genre, RPGs have been offering uh, all kinds of decisions, uh, such as you can uh, decide what kind of character you want to play, a fighter, a thief, a monk who becomes the Grandmaster of Flowers. Uh, they presented decisions like, do you want to solve something with uh, direct force or manipulation? They pr- present moral choices. Uh, like, I'm out. Do you- I'm out. All right. <laughs> Do you want to kick puppies or give money to beggars? And you get to watch how the world reacts. Matt, uh, but Matt. we had grander plans. Um, Joe needs more apple juice. You son of a bitch. I'm on it. <laughs> we had uh, bigger plans. You could say we had a chip on our shoulder. <laughs> we wanted to make a game with deeper, way deeper levels of consequence. And we wanted the payoff to be in the pitfalls of, of all your decisions uh, to, to commit to you longer and we want all the choices to make me harder and to come at you what, faster. What are you doing? What is that voice? What is... <laughs> Do you watch That's the amazing Brothers? innuendo voice. Yeah. That's my really bad imitation of, a, of the monarch. Everything is funny. Really? really? Yeah. Really? I've got, I've got the eyebrows. I just, you know. So. Anyway. You don't uh, have the voice, though. I no, say. I'm yeah. terrible. Okay, sorry, I, I should ahead. stick to game design. Uh, so how do we do this? Um, uh, why don't I make just a boring bullet point thing? Okay, there you go. That's all the answers right there. You can leave now. Um, so we aimed for long-term reactivity. Um, having choices, uh, made in any, we want to have choices that you make in any part of your game um, come back at you, uh, not just at the end, but all throughout the game. We wanted to have um, not just like multiple endings, but multiple middles. Uh, so you take a game like Baldur's Gate. Uh, I'll give you a multiple middle. Ooh, wow, that sounds sexy. Right. You have to use your innuendo voice. I'll give you, I'll multiple, give you middles. A multiple middle. Yeah. See how All right. much better that was? So, Baldur's Gate was kicks ass, and if you haven't played it, you really ought to. Um, there's a lot of decisions you can make. Unfortunately, uh, you always fight Saravok in the end. Sorry, spoilers. Um, <laughs> and then you have a game like uh, Fallout. Uh, Fallout has lots of choices. And, uh, and so you might decide to, like, say, ally with the Brotherhood of Steel or destroy them. Um, you only see, really, the ramifications of that in the area and maybe in a random encounter. And then you, you see nothing about that, that decision until the end of the game when you get a series of slides, you know, reacting to your responses. But for the most part, the build of the game isn't changed. So without dropping a bunch of spoilers on you, um, here's kind of, like, how we do it. <laughs> yeah, you like that? Censored. Um, Censored. Mm, yeah. That's, that's actually how the game looks. Yeah, that, that's... <laughs> You told them our secrets. We, we ran out of money with a character modeling budget. Yeah. We're like, you know what? The emoticons yeah. worked for Moon. They'll work for us. I'm not just a designer. I'm also a character artist. Uh, so you're on a mission. You decide the people that, on the, that are on that mission uh, need to die horribly. So instead of being stealthy, you just blast them to the crap. And you meet a guy. Uh, let's call him NBCA. Uh, he's very upset by this decision. And this sets off a series of, of interactions which end in a very fatal shootout. 
But by the enemy of my enemy rule, uh, this, this earns you a friend. And then you end up in this uh, very difficult assault mission later on, and that friend that you made helps you out. And then from that mission, there's a ton of other choices. So every decision you're making sort of changes the middle. Yeah, keep drinking, bitches. <laughs> Uh, so we wanted to, to inflict moral ambiguity on the player. Uh, good and evil is fun if that's what your game is about. Um, when Ultima 4 introduced uh, the exploration of values in the 80s, it was pretty freaking awesome. As Joe Biden would say, it's a big fucking deal. And unfortunately, you could only be good to beat the game. So when Kotor, Kotor came out, it uh, made it awesome to be good or evil. Um, these games have a common, uh, something in common, though. Uh, you get points for being uh, good or evil. Uh, in our game, um, we decided that good and evil doesn't really fit in the genre, and it doesn't fit in the way we want to present choice. No. Uh, espionage is a pragmatic thing. At, it, it's all about nationalism and justified deception and violence. So, is really, Jack Bauer really good or evil, or does it depend on the circle? I'm sorry, sir. He's chaotic good. You're so deep. <laughs> You're, so, you're also deep. Um, that, that he, well, he could be. Yeah, no, yeah. We're, we're, he's kind of lawful. I don't know. I'm going to argue with that one. Yeah. He's got a strict code of ethics. This is an awesome discussion that should not happen neutral. later. All right. Sorry, you could, Matt. You could skip a couple slides. Uh, Let's go on to your bullet points, Matt. <laughs> Come on, bullet points. We don't Come want on, Matt. Bring them. We don't want the player playing the game searching for brownie points. There's no good spy points or bad spy points in the game. We just have results. Uh, so if we, say, gave you a core stat that was based on how much you lie, you would only lie to like, collect those sweet lying points. So when, whenever the player is all just looking for a systemic reward, they stop thinking about the narrative consequences of their choices. And this kind of leads to the concept of avoiding no-brainers. So you're playing Zelda. Ooh, do you want a potion that heals you once or a heart container that makes you better for the rest of the freaking game? Wow. Tough choice. Now, a lot of RPGs have been doing these no-brainer things in little ways. Um, again, when you're done with this uh, lecture, please get uh, Bloodlines and play it. It's awesome. Uh, in Bloodlines, you have these sweet uh, dialogue skills, which let you seduce, intimidate, do all this fun stuff. Uh, the problem is it takes some of the choice out of your gameplay. Um, so you're, you're trying to get this chick to, to suck out her blood. Oh, son of a bitch. Yeah. And now you have the option of using this uh, sweet seduction line, uh, but it really stops. It takes all the choice out because why would you choose any other line but the seduction line? I mean, it's got the best font. That's true. It's got the I mean, fucking best font. It's it, it's a choice in the sense that you Jesus, have stop that. You could decide between using a toilet or shitting in your pants. It, it's it's that level of decision making. So, like in our game, we decided to get away with uh, dialogue skills. There's no one skill that you can invest in that makes all the de all the decisions super easy. And we went to great lengths to give uh, an opportunity cost and risk to everything you did. So you meet this weapons dealer, you can extort him, you can arrest him, you can shoot him. There's short-term and long-term implications of everything you do, and there's no obvious best choice. Um, and that led us to having more than one choice. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, we, need to, we need to offer not just lots of decision points, but lots of decisions at every crossroads. Um, so, old school nerds would cry when you bring up Eris. Um, like, oh, it's a sad story. She dies and all that stuff. Uh, as great as Final Fantasy... Spoiler, yeah. but yeah. Pass, the, pass the statue Sorry, limitations. Yeah. I hadn't beat pass that the yet. Statu oh. And King, King Kong dies at the end, too. I weep for you. <laughs> so, it's, it's, it's always going to play out the same way. You play Bioshock, you at least have these yes or no choices. At the end of the game, you see an aggregation of all those choices and, and how the God, ending is. Step in the right it. direction. <laughs> Uh, four times. <laughs> but for Alpha Protocol, we wanted to offer like my mouth. three or four decisions uh, whenever we gave you something. And so it seemed like this guy, you know, good cop, bad cop just wasn't enough. We wanted to have different gradations. Like, do you hold your uh, cards close to your chest? Do you, are you threatening? Are you suave? Or do you just slam his head to the bar? Um, but offering all these different options is pretty tough. Uh, permutations add up. Oh, man, do they add up. So I want to talk about the guys who actually really made our game awesome. Are, you, are your slides done now? Yeah. Okay. You made our game John awesome too, man. are the ones who actually did all the, the awesome work. For every designer who's like, ooh, wouldn't this be cool? These are the guys who actually put in the long hours to make that cool happen. We also put so, in the hours that said, no, that ain't going to happen. Yeah, they did that too. <laughs> but, these, if, yeah. but, no, but no, it's not going to happen, but in an awesome way. Uh, yeah. But our game actually kicks ass because really of awesome. these guys. So Joe and Sean. Okay, get out, get out of his chair. Oh. All right. Sean, get over here. Go here, ladies and gentlemen, Matt McLean. And I am sorry if I am not talking right, but I've had a lot of uh, apple juice. Uh, <laughs> choice, 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 choice. Uh, <laughs> fucking. <laughs> All right, so where are my slides? Oh, oh right, oh, there's video. video. Here's a video of stuff. This is a. F <laughs> <laughs> this is. 
if this you could the, at least uh, pretend to be more excited, that would be great. I, uh, where the wow? Where did you guys hide the video? He closed. So um, you I'm going to play some intermission music. So what, what we're actually going to show you right now is the finished version of one of, of the of scenes Windows. where you meet one of the NPCs. Named Windows Z. is a fine product. And All right, Joe here we just go. Played it. Final version of the scene. Must be a small army out there. Ah uh, ah uh, ah! Uh. Come out, or I'll shoot through those boxes you are crouching behind. Wouldn't want that. Ah, American, CIA. I am surprised I did not hear you in Moscow. I'm on vacation. So you come here for the scenery? Or are you here to catch a train, darling? Let's ditch the interrogation. You're here for the missiles, so let's not play games. Darling, I do not play games. And apparently neither do you. But we should talk. I do we're, not want to... We're not going to talk. All right. <laughs> For the so so interest of time, we're not going to actually show the whole thing. We'll just show the first choice and then keep moving. Choice. Oh man. That was two. Where is my mouse? All right. So, without protocol, the scope of, of what we were doing is, is kind of impressive to note. We had 180, over 180 reactive sequences. 180. That's wow, right. Joe, that's a... Who wrote all those? Man, I don't know, some, some guy. Uh, me, and, me and Matt and Travis Stout, who could not be here today. If you see Travis Stout anywhere, anyone named Travis Stout, just hug him. You, you, go, you know what? You helped save our project, dude. We had over 12 hours of total cinematic footage. Only about four hours of that is actually going to be seen in a single playthrough. We had 16 major characters to animate, rig, all that stuff, and we had countless more just secondary NPCs. It was really hard to keep track of all of that. <laughs> this, this was our kind of rudimentary way of, of keeping track of that. Yeah. Uh, this was actually, I can't take credit for anything besides the general of the general, or the, the drawing of the general yeah. down there. B Big Time Bullock is, uh, Don't is, you, is Joe. It is, it is terrifying like. to walk into an office and see that covering the it's entire wall. <laughs> you know what, I accept responsibility. That so was in fact my choice. What happened was, is we had all these scripts and I had to try and organize it because they all connected and reconnected because RPGs like to connect things and, and you play in almost any order. Shot. Because of all the choice arrows, you go left and right. Um, yeah, so we laid it all out on the whiteboard, and we were like, "Oh, we got a lot of work to do." And uh, the interesting part is, one of those little circles there is what you just saw. Well, that, that's not, actually it's like about a third of that level, uh, which is whole level. that one dot. By the way, guys, MO2 is like our, our, our nomenclature for uh, Moscow level two. Do you guys see how we came up with the MO2? It's kind of a code thing, but yeah. It's, it's very, comp very technical. I can go into Chris, it later. Chris, we're talking right now. I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm so liquored up right now. I'm feeling really good. <laughs> you mean, Apple, you juice. mean juice step, juice right, step. Along. Yeah. All right, so this is just our intro to that. that. That was pretty much the scene that you saw just right there. The, actually, the two first little bubbles are most of what you just saw. The choices are here. These are where you're actually going to be you know, choosing, I want to say this or say that. Oh, choice, 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 choice. Um, <laughs> the reactivity checks are here. This is actually a fairly less complicated scene. What's a re reactivity check? A reactivity check, Sean is where we talk, uh, we, we check out what the player has already chosen and made a choice about, <laughs> and, and then actually change what happens based on that choice that the player already made. <laughs> so this is a slightly more complex scene. You were so fucking scene. fired when we get back. <laughs> <laughs> if I can even remember who you are. <laughs> there was some guy there who kept saying choice. It might have been Dan Rubicaba, blah, 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 blah. I'm watching you, Dan. <laughs> All right, so this is one of our slightly more complex scenes. I, I wish I could say it was the most complex thing we had in the game, but that would be a lie. Uh, the choices are here, and the reactivity checks are here. Nerd bonus. This is plus for plus. you. This, this is was all like, for you. This was like two months of my fucking life. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. But it's awesome, and that's kind of the whole point. So, when we get back to here, I, there's a slide of something. All right, oh. 
So this is basically what you guys just saw. This tiny little chunk of stuff. I mean, there's, so the top part is holding guns in their hand. Don't worry about that stuff. But the, those first two little blocks are that entire cinematic sequence. Uh, I'm, I'm going to toss it over to Sean, I think, okay, to talk a little bit more about this. this. Okay, the, fir the first two blocks is just the guys shooting at each other. And then um, the second block checks. It kind of checks how, who you just talked to and what hubs you've been to. And it splits off into four different directions. So you, you actually, as a player, haven't made any choices. Oh, nice. Some of them. That was totally an accident. Uh, um, I'll, and then you get, you, I'll, I'll break in to say that when you start a sequence sometimes, uh, the game's going to be checking to see what you did previously. And because there's so many optional missions in the game, that's going to have a lot of unintended consequences when you actually start other missions. So you're going to see differences whether you start a mission clean and fresh versus whether you've already done all the other missions in the hub and then you start that other mission. Yeah, it's actually slightly... Sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, it's no, slightly, no, I, I interrupted you. It, <laughs> It's actually slightly deceptive to say the player hasn't made a choice yet. What is actually happening is that we're reacting to something that has already happened. Maybe someone you've killed or let not something. Okay, so you get, it goes into four choices and then it checks three more things. And then so now it, there's seven. And then it goes and then, then you actually get a chance, stance choice is what you just saw. And you get to do suave, aggressive, professional and an action choice. And then it keeps going. But um, if we actually go into one of these squares... Inside of that is one of these guys, which is one of these guys, and this is like how all the animations are set up, and it gets guess, even more complicated. <laughs> um, and that was nothing. That was like a baby. Yeah, this is <laughs> a baby scene. Um, so this is actually what the Unreal Editor looks like. Kind of boring. Um, <laughs> and awesome. That brings us to production. Would you like to cover production, Joe? Yes, pre-production. So just for one little scene, what we do every stage of every scene... We did script reading and revisions for about three days. We did level alteration for about two days, making sure everything was going to be set up right. We did choreography walkthroughs, where mainly I just kind of punched Sean a lot. Uh, we did shot lists and storyboards, where I got people to draw awesome pictures and then didn't use them all the time. Uh, we did concepts of look pretty people with boobs. Uh, we did character models. They have more boobs. Uh, rigging. Rigging the boobs. <laughs> Generic facial asset animation. Ah, that's too many words. Uh, just, just move on. Just block move on. in. And oh, and here's this. Is, is that, that actually going to play? No, it's no, not going to play. Gonna work. All right, this, this is where is, I struggle to play video this is again. The, this is the block in before we actually had a script. Um, Joe so, just explained the scene to me, and I had to come up with something, and this took a couple days. And, and so it's kind of neat to well, look at. Well, Sean, Sean kind of, yeah. Here we go. Where is it? There we go. Volume up, please. No, so yeah, they're, they're, oh yeah, sorry. There's no volume. So, so this was, uh, imagine if you will, the shoes crunching. Pew 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 pew. Get down, get down. Pew pew. Someone's pew. firing at us. Oh god. Pew, Some pew, chick who's not pew, dressed pew, for the pew. cold. Pew 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 pew. Ah. Pew pew pew. Oh my god, pew, I've got a big pew, gun. Pew, pew, I like pew, shooting pew. that shit. Pew, yeah. Pew, pew, pew. Oh, oh, now I'm gonna reload. Up. Now I'm now I'm gonna look off of this thing. It's kind of a way to establish really early on what's going on in the level, so you can actually designers can play the level and know what's going on easily. Is the idea. And they know there's something awesome that's going to happen there, and it sets the mood. Anyways, so Sean will talk now. Uh, so we go into production, and I'll just break it down real quick. Uh, voice recording, then you go into motion capture shoots, which takes some time. That's a picture of me directing a motion capture shoot. That scene is in the game. For reference, that is Sean humping a roll of carpet. Yeah. yeah. Jo Joe's the blurry image that's moving quickly and apparently laughing, and then there's the uh, actress that we're recording in the studio, who's also laughing. <laughs> this is not, a, not the highest moment of my career. But we did have some really high talent motion Matt capture. Matt, that up. Matt actually suited up to do motion capture once. I helped once. you set up the cameras, and you, this is you how you're You shut up. It's my turn. Choice. <laughs> uh, global variables that and was, tracking. That was preemptive. Uh, we did camera layout, first pass. Second pass takes a little longer. Uh, sound effects and music. Make adjustment based on feedback, which Chris always gives me, and I love him for that. Uh, you know what? I don't always do it. You're being, God, you're being such a whiner right I now. said I love you for that. Oh. But it was sarcastic Jeez. love. Oh, but, shh. And then, so, we have this huge bar. <laughs> All that work for one little scene. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Sorry, 69. 552 hours of some dude's time sitting at a computer for two to two and a half minutes of gameplay. That's what choice costs. <laughs> That's a... Uh...
So that's kind of why you don't actually see oh, choice in games very often, because it's pretty hard to do. You son and of a... <laughs> so we put together this montage of all the stuff that you could miss. If you don't, if you don't talk to Z, if you never meet her, you can miss all this stuff. And so we wanted to show you guys, so... Uh, yeah, let's emphasize that. That's totally optional. You could have totally missed it. Uh, Michael, I did not realize you knew how to kill so well. Nice bust. Thank you, darling. Shh, little girl. Time for the big boys to play now, yeah? Looks like I'm cougar hunting. Where's Z now? One less enemy to worry about. Michael, darling. I was wondering why you were tied up. Although I had not expected the reason to be so... Little. I am here because I never got the chance to tell you my feelings. And now you have no choice but to listen. Great. Oh, you that doesn't count. count. That was yesterday. Damn this you is today, Z. Michael. And you need someone else riding shotgun. So it's worth noting that if you simply don't go on that mission, you will never meet Z and never see all of that and never see all the hard work that these guys put in. But that's the cost of choice. <laughs> you weren't even talking. I know. So uh, before we go back to Chris Avalon, I'd like to point something out. Choice. Oh, <laughs> you son of a... You know what? We you were done speaking, left. sir. So we've got to move it. Well, I guess that's why we're, uh, we're going to wrap it up now. Uh, let's see if I can find it past my haze. Uh, you know yeah. what? I'm yeah. down. Just keep down. pressing buttons. Yeah. Are you sure? No, you're not. If I keep yeah. pressing. We need to bring up uh, PowerPoint, actually. This is very confusing all of a sudden. PowerPoint's hard. Why is PowerPoint so difficult? There we go. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. Wow. Hey, well, In great works. big letters. That's really reassuring. Um, so to wrap it up. Uh, so why do we do all this stuff? Well, because... Um, <laughs> What we're really looking for is uh, not experience points, but uh, what we're striving for here is if two separate people are playing the game, say it's either me or it's uh, the beautiful Matt McLean. Uh, when, Matt, when Matt and I talk about playing Alpha Protocol, uh, we want to have two completely different conversations about what happened. And uh, we think that's core to the role-playing game experience. If you want a static story, we've got plenty of books, uh, movies, TV to keep you occupied until the ends of time. Uh, RPGs, uh, computer games, those are intended to be interactive media. And when we set out to make a role-playing game, uh, we've made a pact with a player. If, you, if we have allowed you to make a choice, either with building your character, or a choice in how you approach the missions, or even a choice at, Oh, wow, I didn't even mean that. I was, trying to be, I was trying to be really powerful there, and it came across as sneaky as underhanded. That's awesome. <laughs> For every choice, uh, we want to make sure that we pay the player back with a consequence in terms of world reactivity, and that's our pact with the player. Um, so that being said, uh, that is our presentation on But Thou Must, uh, Choice in RPGs, and that is your cell phone, Matt. Wow, it's saying hello it's to me. Mine. That's Sorry. All. Oh. Yeah. Damn it, Sean. You always do this when I'm trying to be there. All right. <laughs> so uh, we have a lot of people to thank for this presentation, uh, a lot of hard work from the Off Protocol Cinematics team. Uh, there are a lot of names here, uh, two of which uh, are up here right now. And uh, if you uh, want to uh, drop us a line uh, after the panel, uh, you are welcome to. I'm going to leave the contact information up there as soon as it gets done scrolling, which oh, probably that won't. that is fancy. Dude, that is <laughs> seriously. Oh, it, it's genuinely scrolling? I thought, it was, I thought I was imagining that. All right. So uh, now I'd like to start with questions. And preempt we had a preemptive strike up here. Awesome. <laughs> Hi, guys. First, I'd just like to point out that I played um, Choice the Drinking Game, the at-home version. This started full. <laughs> oh. This well is done. a leader. Oh. Well done. You, you if I had taken, here with us. If I had taken we... full drinks as opposed to sips, I would have done the gallon challenge <laughs> really easily. Um, my actual... My actual question is, um, so for example in uh, Eternal Darkness, I'll use code names so as not to make spoilers. If you were to ally yourself with um, Silly Tooth, you would end up fighting Alley Oop at the end. But at the very, very end, you'd still fight Manta Ray. Um, 
So <laughs> I'll let you Okay, oh, I, I'm rolling with this. I really am. So <laughs> you get the choice of your intermediate boss, kind of, but the end is the same, and you still have to play the colonial dude and everything, uh, no matter who, who you're allying with. So I guess the question is, what do you, do you think that a better game comes from keeping the story free from railroading or for making the individual choices, like the, the more smaller minutia choices that don't affect endgame, do you think that it's more important for that to be open-ended or for the storyline in general? Wow. Um, I had Deep. way too much apple juice to follow that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think it's just a matter of making sure that your decisions are meaningful. Um, games are expensive, and there's only so many like, end bosses uh, you can make. Uh, to our credit, we have multiple. Uh, but um, I think it's, it's, it's um, having multiple middles is great, having multiple ends is great. I think it's, it's mostly the ability to uh, play a game and have a, a series of decisions that, as an aggregate, let you experience something completely different. And then when you're talking to your friend and you talk about like, what, you know, what you did, um, is it completely different? So, gosh, that's a tough question. I, I, I think it would be great if all games could have like, multiple endings and multiple end stages for everything. But it also costs like millions just to get a single uh, entity in the game. So, gosh. Um. Uh, I will say for your boss battle example, to give you a concrete example, uh, yeah. in Alpha Protocol, uh, it actually changed, like, one way of behaving will actually change your middle boss and several end bosses as well. So yeah. we've tried to actually not change the end boss, but the middle one as well, because we just want to take it up to that next level. Yeah. Take it up a notch, cool. Thank you. I'm going to go. <laughs> um, all right. First, oh, all right. First of all, I just want to ask: uh, Do you guys use TV tropes at all? Uh, use uh, TV terms? Tropes. Oh, that's a website. great site. Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it factored at all into Alpha Protocol, but it's a great site. Is it presentation. I, no, I don't believe so. Yeah. Right, right. Um, the actual question I was asking is, how do you avoid an objectively better choice in a video game to uh, give two examples? Let's say you, know, you have a good or evil or whatever choice, and one is much harder to perform, and it'll also have ramifications in the end of the game that'll make it much harder. Uh, you know, you have, again, you said you have the choice of getting the heart container that gives you a permanent health boost or the health potion. There's an objectively better choice. How does the actual thought process go in making sure that each choice is viable but not generic. Most of your uh, decisions as to like, who you are as like, an RPG entity, as like, your powers and your strengths and all that stuff, that is purely a function of you doing missions and getting experience points. Um, when you interact with people, um, to put it this way, there's no like, um, stealth skill that has to be taught to you by an NPC. And you don't have to like, psychically know that this is the guy who teaches you the awesome stealth skill. And then you know, if, you, if you make enemies with that person, you're somehow screwed in your build. Uh, all the choices you make have, um, there is a chance that something might make like, the next mission harder, but it's likely to make a mission after that easier. Um, and it's impossible to have all choices be equal, nor would you want them to be. Um, but we try to keep the, like, the character potential separate from, say, the conversation choices. The conversation choices might influence like, alliances, enemies, and mission setups, but like, your ability to kick ass is based on completing objectives and not on being nice or being mean. Um, so there's no, there's no loss in power uh, from playing any particular type of agent you want to be. So, yeah, please basically behave the way you want when playing Alpha Protocol. And they actually lay those rules out for you at the beginning. Uh, what, would, what would be commonly considered like bad karma options uh, actually just have different consequences and different rewards over the course of the game? Yeah. Hi. Howdy. I'm a liberal arts major. So I have difficulty with choice. <laughs> My question is, as games get more cinematic, obviously the dialogue takes up less space on the screen generally, and you wouldn't want to have a voiceover actor just repeat everything that you've just read. Um, you're doing things a little differently here, and one of the things that you've done differently is that you've added a time limit. So for a laid-back, turn-based, long-time role-playing gamer, how Yes, do you we have basically screwed you. <laughs> and, and we did that intentionally Yeah, you better enjoy it You know what, it's because we hate you too yeah. <laughs> Wow Adapt or die 
Um, I'm sorry, but we're actually going to let you finish your question because we're being horribly rude up here. And drunk. No, that's all right. All right. <laughs> so, um, so you threw me off now. <laughs> Um, but basically, I, I understand that you're getting people in, in the head of the character, and that's great. But how do you re- take some of the pressure off of the gamer while doing that? Well, actually, uh, if, if I could, the whole point is to job. put pressure on you. I mean, so many role-playing games let you sit back and kind of plan and game the system. And the whole point of Alpha Protocol's dialogue system was to actually get you caught up in that sort of spy moment, in that sort of you know, James Bond, Bauer, whatever you want to call it, that imperative moment where someone is kind of going along by the, by the, the seat of their pants. And the whole point of our dialogue timer is to make sure you feel that. You don't get to sit back and say, like, well, I think this character would like this thing. You're going to be making choices on the fly, keeping it exciting, and, and uh, uh, hopefully keeping it imperative the entire time so you never get to sit back and think you're going to be excited, you're going to be drawn into those conversations, you're going to be paying attention to those conversations, always trying to think what you want There's to do There's also some next. intuition built into the way the dialogue systems worked. The choice on your left is always like the suave, like sort of the, Jason, uh, the James Bond choice. The top one's always the aggressive Jack Bauer choice, and the right one's always kind of your professional uh, Jason Bourne... Or, Whatever his name was. Yeah, there, there shouldn't choice. be any gotcha choices that so, you ever accidentally get. If you're ever yeah. feeling really pressed for time, you know generally, you know, uh, common collected, total dick, um, kind of sarcastic and snide. And, and so you always at least know intuitively what generally you're choosing. Okay. Uh, okay, well, to, to answer your question, like, before you get into conversations, there are some that actually get sprung on you over the course of the game. There's other ones where you know who you're going to be talking to beforehand. And um, there's another system that we had in Alpha Protocol where we wanted you to be able to do psychological research on subjects. And what you can do is you actually get their dossier information. You can find out what their psychological triggers are before you even enter that conversation. And it gives you clues as to potential reactions they may have, whether you're being suave, aggressive, whether you're doing an action or whatever. Um, I guess what we're trying to shoot for here is that when you're having a conversation in 24, um, there's always that sense of urgency behind the scenes, there's and we no wanted time. to. We, <laughs> there's there's no time, um, <laughs> and we wanted to convey that sense of urgency in the conversation system too. And we actually thought that that would be appropriate for the genre as well. Um, I'll be honest; it's kind of an experimental feature, so I have no idea uh, how the customers are going to react to it. Um, we did awesome. We, we did. Love it. <laughs> you know, but. You know, I'll be honest though. Like, I, I didn't want I didn't want to get to this point in my career and not at least try and do at least like like one experimental thing with each RPG we do just to see if it works or not. And it felt like the cinematic DSS the designers proposed uh, that seemed like a, a perfect system to test out. And you know what? It fit the genre. So we're like, all right, sure, let's just give it a shot. Hey, five minutes. Mm-hmm. Oh, Jeez. Okay. Hand signals don't work with people. Go ahead. Oh, I thought you were waving at me. All right. Um, it seems like the state of the art for managing choice in a game like this is still uh, lots of static scripts, checking and setting uh, six trillion flags, creating those beautiful um, flowcharts. Uh, what kind of research has been done either by you or others you're aware of on creating more sophisticated, perhaps, uh, gameplay systems where a lot of that would then become emergent behavior of the gameplay systems instead of requiring handwritten million scripts, checking and setting a trillion flags? So one thing that we actually tried to avoid a lot of was non-deterministic results. If you go for emergent behavior, you're always going to have non-deterministic, which which is to say you don't know how it's going to happen, you don't know when it's going to end, you don't know when it's going to start, etc. With us, to capture that cinematic feel, to get the whole spy movie thing, you have to go with a deterministic system. Big words are hard right now, I'm sorry. so, personally for us, that wasn't going to be a smart fit. There are some games that can pull that off, but at least for Alpha Protocol, that was one of the choices we made very early, is we were going to go with high-value, deterministic uh, scenes, and that choice... Choice. Oh, uh, I'm out. Okay, good, good. I'm not uh, dry, though. I really have to uh, pee. I'm like, really fucking bad. So, Emergent, I... You know, I... 
eh, emergent stuff, whatever. Um, so, so there's some titles where that, where that behavior is absolutely appropriate, and I would argue that Fallout is one of those titles. Uh, we made a conscious choice to sort of keep the reins in with, with, with that kind of behavior and alpha protocol, and it's just a choice we made. And uh, there's no beer up here, so I have no ulterior motive for saying that. Uh, do you think that's a choice you'll revisit for future games, or is this uh, kind depends of on the genre you guys like? Depends on the genre. Cool. All right, I'm done. <laughs> Excuse me. Wow. <laughs> Hi. Um, a lot of games have kind of um, really little insignificant choices and then huge world changing ones. Do you have a particular way to handle the fact that in real life sometimes you make a choice that you know, it, it matters, but it's not like, like one of the ones that, oh, you know, this, this is a huge choice, it gains you three dark side points, and, and your other choice you know, gains you three light side points, because yes, I, I played the, the KOTRs. <laughs> Yeah, do you have any way to handle the, the middle ground in addition to huge and little choices? Okay, so I'm going to say that we actually have no middle ground. Uh, our design <laughs> philosophy is this. Um, when you actually make a choice in the game, uh, there's two types of reactivity you should see. One is immediate reactivity because that, that's more instant gratification for the player. The nice thing is when you perpetuate that choice throughout the remainder of the game as well. So we actually shoot for immediate reactivity and then long-term reactivity. Um, in terms of middle reactivity, uh, I don't know if you ever consciously thought of that, but we, we, when we make, we make choices in the game, we want those to matter almost immediately to the player, and then we want to see those play out in really cool ways in the end game as well, and that was sort of our design philosophy with Alpha Protocol. Thank you. All right, uh, last, last one? All right, last one. Oh, okay, oh. that was the last one. Oh, Thanks, everyone. Oh. But seriously, we will be right outside the hall. Yeah, All you of guys, us are happy to talk to you. I will be in the you. bathroom. You guys are right. super awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs>